All right. So welcome to the KCP community meeting on June 7th. Agenda is still short. So if you have topics, just add them. And um, yeah, we have the usual ones. Maybe I go over the first two. So we have tagged a 0 0.5 release. Alpha one, so we needed the second try because there was something broken in image building, I think. So it's alpha one. Um, we have closed all milestones, so all epics are closed or they have moved to the next epic if they were multi epic already, multi release. That's fine. So we have the usual task about open issues, but we, as usual, put them at the end. And we have three topics. Um, let me read. All right, Paul, this is fine if we go to those first. Yeah, I think, that's, planning. I think that's great. I, I did want to say a thank you to everyone's work on 0 0.5 that Stefan was pointing out that we closed out. There was a lot in there. Our, our themes were advanced scheduling and finishing up some service account work and exploring stateful apps. and. We got that. We got uh, the advanced scheduling closed out. The location API MVP was in there. We had items for usability and app authoring, with the SA, the service account cube configs, CRD snapshot command as a usability improvement, the code generating wrappers for clients and informers. That's awesome. Um, and another really cool one in the API evolution phase was. Uh, adding authorization for restricting access to objects of an API binding, another really cool thing. But even more, there were numerous refactoring PRs in there. If you go through the change log, uh, there were race conditions being fixed, bugs and tests being uh, fixed and added, um, and more off work that we didn't even capture in the themes. So thank you to everyone's work on 05. There's also nine first time contributors. So if you're on the call, Welcome and thank you for uh, uh, joining the adventure. But on to 0 0.6. Very good, thank you. All right, so let's let's move to the technical topics first and then we can use the rest of the time on planning, I would suggest. So the first one is organizational, as I understand. I'm not sure what the forename is, Rein. So if you want to talk, see here. Are you asking Ryan? Yes, Ryan Cook is the one. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh. Um, <laughs> missed the beginning of it. Uh, so I think we have identified all of the folks that will um, you know, be able to give us the best story in regards to the storage mobility work. Um, you know, I think it's more along the lines of, is it possible to get some time with you know, Paul, Andy, Stefan, Rob, just someone to make sure that what we're identifying as tasks that we'd like to hit are kind of what you guys are expecting. Uh, similar to what OpenShift does in the uh, epics and sprint planning. Um, I don't know if we want to have that as a separate community call or if it's something that yeah, we can so, do off the um, We just skipped the topic about planning and design. So this week is meant for those meetings. So invite people interested in topics and talk through them is exactly with the goal you described, like coming up with an epic which is scoped and maybe a demo workflow uh, where you see how it, it's uh, used afterwards. So this is exactly the topic um, for this week. And I think Paul will talk about that after the other technical topic. Is this okay? Sounds great. I believe uh, Guy has already identified a couple of those um, initial topics, so perfect. Okay, perfect. So let's postpone that to the V6, C06 uh, planning. In a few minutes. So before we do that, Mike, you have a question about PNF. Well, I just put it to, on the agenda. Um, I mean, we could talk about it. I mean, do I you want to talk about it now, um, or uh, I mean, we can, we can spend some minutes. That's fine. So, all right. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there is this feature, you know, in Kubernetes called API Priority and Fairness. Um, it is a uh, generalization of the uh, older uh, Max in flight filter. Uh, it is about regulating concurrency, which is uh, 
one step more advanced than regulating rate. So um, if you just regulate uh, QPS, you're assuming that the cost to serve every request is the same, uh, which is really not true. Um, so uh, the max in flight filter, it is uh, adding the, the recognition, or it, it kind of takes one step beyond that and says, okay, let's suppose that the cost to serve a request is proportional to the time to serve the request. Um, and you know, the average of uh, rate and duration is occupancy. Um, so that's why regulating occupancy uh, takes care of uh, regulating both rate and duration uh, together in a natural way. Um, and, and APF follows in that way. Um, and it adds uh, customizable, first off, it's configurable. Uh, and it's got, um, rather than the, the fixed two concurrency pools of the max and fly filter, that, that has two concurrency pools, one for reads and one for writes. Uh, APF has a configurable set of concurrency pools, uh, configurable classification, and adds a concept of queuing. Um, Chris, were you trying to catch my attention? Oh, okay. Um, Sorry. Now, we um, have realized, you know, from experience that um, that's this regulating concurrency still is, is falls down or falls short of uh, you know, reality uh, in a couple of important cases. One is the max and flight filter did not even make any attempt to regulate long running requests in any way. Um, and that includes watches. Um, and you know, my initial hypothesis was if you regulate the other stuff, uh, the watches will kind of follow. Um, putting some you know, regulation in the watches is uh, potentially uh, somewhat problematic was, was a, a concern that I had. Um, in APF, we added regulation of watches, uh, and we also responded to something that was observed in practice, which is that uh, when you uh, some of the list requests, the ones that return uh, really long lists, are exceptionally costly amongst requests of the same duration or similar duration. So we've um, made two. Um, uh, you know, adjustments or special considerations uh, beyond just regulating concurrency. One is regulating, um, or just recognizing that some requests, particularly lists with a long result, uh, can be expect especially expensive. So we handle that by saying they can, uh, rather than occupy one unit of concurrency, uh, occupy a general number of units, which we call seats of concurrency. And for watches, there's two considerations. One is to recognize that, as, as you may recall, in a watch, in, depending on the parameters, uh, it'll, it may start with a burst of notifications to, to bring the client up to speed with the uh, existing state. Uh, and in that case, that burst is an exceptional cost. And then there's the regular cost, which is not really um, synchronous with the watch request, but it's synchronous, roughly synchronous, with the other uh, write requests. So what we've done is we've made uh, added some uh, additional um, consideration, which is basically seat occupancy uh, for a write request. We extend its uh, seat occupancy in the logic in APF um, in proportion to the number of corresponding watch clients. Anyway, so that's the outline of the way that works. Um, you know, I asked how is that going to work in KCP. Uh, you know, I think currently. I mean, there is no special consideration. Uh, it seems likely to me that, uh, and I think uh, Stefan responded, you know, in a similar thought, uh, that this is we're going to have to have something like that that is uh, cognizant yeah. of workspaces and the configuration in individual workspaces. I used one keyword in my sentence, my answer, something absolute, some values the user can see, like about. SLO, quality of service, QPS, whatever it is, or seats, or what was the name? Uh, Concurrency. Um, frequency term, right? times uh, frequency times duration, how you call it. Yeah, yeah, your rate times duration. Yeah, so something like that. Something which is absolute and independent from the shot. So something in this direction I think we need. The challenge um, is a bit, just let me finish um, this sentence maybe. The challenge maybe is a bit different than in cube. In cube, a workload is on a cluster. 
it won't move. It's always there. And then it's a question about distributing the computational and network power of the API server to all the people in a fair and, and I mean, their property is what you want to, to reach. Like, okay. yeah. exactly, something like that. So you want to, 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 to share it in a, in a sensible way, let's say. Here, the user does not know on which chart the user is, the workspace is, and you shouldn't care whether they are noisy neighbors and whether they are 1,000 users on that chart or 100 or just 10 or uh, users alone. So I think we need something which is more absolute and understandable by a user and translate that maybe into P and F. So that's totally fine. So if you can use that, um, that's fine. In other words, um, I think what P and F, there's one property or one, one restriction of P and F. I think you use the word seat, right? Uh, a seat yes. in, in, in the scheduling mechanism. Um, the, the width, the, the size of the seat is not understandable by, by a user, right? So there can be many seats and you get 10 of them, or there can be just few seats on the whole cluster and you get 10, but those 10 mean much more than if there are many. So that's what I mean with something absolute, not relative to the, to the unknown seat number. All right, so um, let me uh, un unpack that a bit. So one question is, uh, how does the capacity of the server get configured? Um, and I, I think that's the uh, one of the central ideas here, which is in plain cube, there is one cluster with basically, we assume one administrative team that understands the load on the cluster. And the uh, that team we suppose, so in, with the existing APF feature, I, I forgot to mention that that side of it, the capacity side. Uh, so the way it works is, uh, you, as you may recall, in the old max and flight filter, there are a couple of command line parameters, the uh, max requests in flight and the max mutating requests in flight that, that simply configure the two concurrency pools. What we've done in APF is we simply uh, add those two numbers together um, and their sum is the concurrency limit for the, the cluster. And then the, the way it's, uh, this division is configured, there is a division into configured concurrency pools. Uh, it's based on uh, relative weights. So there's these things called priority level configurations. Each one has a weight. And the server's total is divided amongst the priority levels uh, in proportion to their uh, shares. We use the word uh, assured concurrency shares. Um, so yes, those are configured in a relative way, uh, and it's all relative to uh, command line parameters. Uh, and right, so for KCP, it's more likely that the right vision is that for each um, uh, workspace or shard or something like that, uh, right, there, there, there's some kind of a unit of isolation there, uh, you would want to assign an absolute you know, concurrency limit, and then have that divided um, you know, within that unit. Um, the seat is, is actually is comprehensible to user. Basically, a seat is an ordinary request uh, being served. Um, the exceptions are that for a list, because they're exceptionally heavy, uh, we suppose that those might occupy more than one seat. You know, but the baseline model is a, a user comprehensible concept. I think the point you're making here is the capacity side. Um, it really needs to be adjusted for the KCP setting. So yeah, let's talk about that. So with that unit of uh, sort of a capacity assignment or absolute capacity assignment, um, with that, because I, I see there's work on, there's an evolution path here for workspaces, right? Uh, so they're, they're becoming more and more soft and adjustable. So is it shard or what's, what's it wouldn't be shard because users don't know about shard either. Right. A shard, a shard is just one, one API server. Plus right, it. but it can have multiple users that don't know anything about oh, each yes. other and should be oh, insulated yes. from each other. Yeah. Right. But a workspace, workspaces are going to be divisible also by users? A workspace is owned by a user, basically. it's Every user has N workspaces. N is different to every user. And what sets probably. N? It's just the number of workspaces you create. You have a quota maybe, but overall, 
I guess from a, from a billing point of view, if you want to build a service on top of that, your credit card is charged by, I don't know, so many seats, like 10,000 seats per month or something, or a million, whatever, uh, seats in your sense, right? And those seats which you buy by the, uh, with a credit card are basically distributed over your workspaces. All right. That's so I'm still idea. learning here about the roadmap here for KCP. I thought I heard something in an earlier meeting about, well, you start in a home workspace and you can create, you know, sub workspaces yeah. if you want. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sort of scenario, then I think, well, I mean, you tell me, right? Um, you know, like like directories, right? Uh, if, as I create subdirectories, I don't have to, you know, sign up for new charges on my credit card, um, and, and it doesn't give me additional quota. Uh, so I mean, I'm trying there to are different. Explain. There are different models. I mean, the simplest model is maybe per per directory per workspace you have quota, and the more complex distributed one is over all your workspaces, right? Those m might make sense. Maybe if I have a production application, I want it per workspace, right? Because this is important. But for everything else, which is not pot, maybe I want an overall quota, quota in the sense of PPS or seats or whatever. Right, so it, it might be simplest if we, we did have a, you know, an absolute concurrency limit per workspace. Um, but now if you start talking about sharing between workspaces we're talking about, then it's it's some, some other unit. Um, what would that unit be? Or, or do we just not want to go there? We don't have to start with this big vision. We can start per workspace and just see how we can use PNF to be helpful for our purpose. That's all fine. It's the same thing with quota. We, we will start with quota per workspace and eventually we want distributed quota. It's a similar problem. All right. So if, uh, okay. maybe to make it concrete, um, so we do planning for zero six uh, in a minute. Can we find a scoped variant of that which we can implement? Like any AWP and F, that's of course an uh, obvious step. But also bring in this capacity absolute measurement thing we talked about. Something so, we can explore. Well, let's yeah, let's see if we can sketch that. Let me try and sketch that out. You can help me fill in the, the blanks here. Yeah. Right, we'll need some way of assigning the concurrency. We might call it a concurrency quota or concurrency limit per workspace. Uh, you know, there's the, there's a number that needs to come from somewhere for each workspace. Um, you know, APF, as I, I kind of mentioned, is configured by these explicit objects, which today are cluster scoped. Uh, we, we would want them to become workspace scoped. Well, I guess they kind of are because that's just the way objects work. Yeah. Um, so each workspace would, would get its own set of these objects. So that would be a mod. There's currently a controller in the server that creates these objects. It would have to be modified to create a set of these objects for each workspace. Um, Administrators can modify these this set of objects uh, within each workspace. Would would be the idea. I mean, currently, and you know, again, there's a controller that provides a default set of these objects, and administrators can change the set of these objects. Um, we we would change the controller so that it provides a set of these objects per workspace, and administrators can change. Oh, by the way, uh, AP says there is a controller that provides the objects that takes place over time. So APF is defined to have some baseline behavior in the absence of any config objects. Yeah. And of course, there's a defined behavior as config objects are, are added. Um, so that kind of answers the question of what happens to a workspace that's been created, but the objects have not yet been created. Um, so lot, lots of that sounds very familiar to the quota problem. Like admins should be able to edit quota at the same time they shouldn't go beyond something like which is imposed from the outside. I think there are similarities. Um, There's probably a higher level thing though as well, right? Because like since the priority and fairness that we're trying to accomplish here are scoped to a single shard, like just taking the controller behavior that currently exists for a cluster and then making it independent, you know, happen independently on every workspace forgets the part where there's a single server serving n workspaces, right? Yeah. I think there are two parts, right? That's what you're saying. It's a distribution you want to define inside of your workspace for your work nodes, 
and there is this upper limit imposed by some external system, like the seeds I have uh, as a right. sum for the exactly. whole workspace. Right. Exactly. Right. Something would, um, but again, I think it, it again, you know, if I understand the the KCP kind of uh, usage scenario, right? You would really want the 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 uh, concurrency limit of a workspace to be a user visible thing, right? You're going to yes. say in a web page some way, right? You sign up to pay this much, you get that many, uh, you know, seats of concurrency limit. So there's going to be somebody that's engineering, you know, a workspaces per shard, right? And I think part of that job will probably it, it may be this simple, right? Um, there's some kind of configuration that goes into running a KCP server. Uh, and it in, it's going to include, uh, you know, some kind of a, a plan for limited number on workspaces per uh, server. And so the server gets configured with the concurrency limit per workspace, uh, you know, and, and that's the, the number that the devs or operators choose for that is based on this. It's, it's part of this engineering of uh, workspaces per server. Yeah. I could see such a demo basically for the prototype that you annotate the, this limit on cluster workspaces. Some mechanism in the background configures P and F. And then we can see that a noisy neighbor will not impact you. Like if you have booked 100 seats per whatever uh, unit of time, you will get some, right? Something like that. Even if the right. noisy neighbor uses or tries to use right. as much as you can. Right, and and again, if the you know concurrency limit per workspace is a constant, uh, you don't even you know need it to appear explicitly on the workspace. It's it's just a constant. And we can it's not constant. It. I mean, there, there will be users which pay right, and they they want more, so it's not a constant. Hiram. Hey, thanks. So I was thinking, so like the things that add load to the KCP are going to be like, you know, users, apps are using the, you know, cube APIs directly. But I think one of the probably heaviest loads on KCP is going to be all the, you know, service providers, you know, writing controllers against the KCP APIs, right? And those are going to be kind of dynamic from the point of view of, oh, a user might, you know, enable this service on this workspace and that, that, that adds load to that workspace, right? So, and then I guess the question to me is like, is it really constant then? And should we allow service providers to be the ones that pay for that load on KCP? Especially if that's like a, something that's charged separately. Like, oh, I want this service and I'm gonna get charged for it, right? Should that affect his I, base, you know, as, you know, quota? So how, how we do billing at the end is a different topic, but I think the service provider will pay as well the same thing. And he will just give the cost to the users using the service in some way via a billing system, whatever. But yes, I mean, right. they are also part of the game here. That's totally true. Um, yeah, so that's why, why I said, like, it might not be constant, right? Because to a user, yeah. he might say, oh, I want this constant rate limit. And if he enables the service, Maybe we don't want that affecting his uh, his quota that he's getting, right? So that means yeah. that the workspace limit needs to get bumped up because the service was enabled on it. Yeah. Um, looking at the time, I mean, this is super interesting. And I think there are a few parties here who would like to dive into that more. Um, Mike, are you, are you able to organize one of those design sessions this week or early next week? Um, so again, I'm new here. I'm not familiar. If you have a kind of a practice or concept of design session, yeah, maybe, maybe um, you see the doc which is not linked, but this one here. This is our candidate theme doc, and there are names behind topics. So I pasted here. Thanks, Paul. So if it's not there yet, add a section about P and F. People, everybody who spoke up here and is interested, just put your name behind and then we can uh, schedule a meeting like one hour where we can go deep into that and try to scope uh, a work item in Epic for the prototype. And the meeting itself is totally open. We can organize it in any way we like, like we just did with discussion or anything we want. That's totally open. Does this find okay, uh, sound okay? 
Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm looking to this doc to understand it. So I'm looking. Uh, so let's see. There's this doc that was point. The last point was shared is this KCP work packages thing. Yeah. And I, I just added here. So look on my shared screen. So I put PNF here. Okay. And I put our two names and whoever wants to, to uh, join as well, please put your name and then we will schedule a meeting this week or okay. the next week or something like that. Okay, so I'll wait for names to appear and then I'll schedule a meeting. Yes. Do that. Yes. Okay. And let me see. Do we have another topic? I don't think we have. So this is a perfect uh, switch to course topic V06. So what is the process to move forward? Paul? Yeah, perfect segue for this. So let's talk a little bit about how we organize for folks that are new and what the expectations are for scoping a milestone. Um, first, like Stefan was saying, is Prior to the milestone start, we brainstorm topics for the milestone in our work packages document here. These are just high level items that we try to align with either the next value proposition we wanna show in KCP or technical decisions that we need to start making in KCP. Uh, so you'll see something like sharding and quota in there that align to both of those types of things. Um, in the first week of the milestone, we ask that we hold design discussions on those with the uh, invite going out in the public forum for folks to join. And the output of those should be an epic level GitHub issue with task breakdowns that clearly define what we think we can commit to in the current milestone and items that may need to track in other milestones so that we have a, a clear scope on that. So that's where we are right now. So what we're looking for today is that we have ownership for high level topics. Anything that does not have ownership will move out of the milestone. And then we ask that those folks drive the de design discussions in public and output the actual GitHub issues from there. Doesn't mean that the owner has to do all the work, but it does mean that they're uh, responsible for driving the conversation and scoping for it. So that's where we stand today. In the next community call, we'd like to go over the output of those discussions so that we all kind of have a good idea of what we're trying to achieve in this milestone. And then anything that does not have an assignee in our GitHub issue list will kick out. And then as people free up uh, within the current milestone, we can pull things back in. But we want to set a good uh, observable expectation of we, what we think we're committing to at the beginning. So with that, we can go through each one of these topics if you'd like to, or asynchronously put your names on there, but do that pretty quick because folks are gonna start sending out invites I'd expect probably tomorrow. You're muted, Stefan. So I just want to show one of those epics. It's a multi-release one, so it's a big one. Um, this is or this should be output of such a discussion, such an epic, which hopefully has demo objectives. This doesn't for I don't know which reasons. I mean this one what is, this one's more like building an SDK. So Oh I, I see. But what is it super important is basically a line like that. That's the scoping part. So try to scope it down, identify what is crucial for the milestone, what are the most important things like Look on the calendar, they are like three weeks or a bit more than three weeks from now. So try to find steps which get us to the goal to something of value. But um, I mean, ha have um, items which go beyond, that's all fine. But try to make this line, draw this line. This is the task, the, end, uh, the main task of this meeting. Have an understanding in the small team of people where this line is and what the, the steps are towards it. So let me go back here. So those are the tasks identified. So there are names already, so we will more or less see what people will work on. Is there anyone leading one of these that would like more help? Maybe you just have one name beside your, your task and maybe there's folks in the call looking for a place to contribute.
or anybody wants to do a pitch for the topic, that's also fine. So if there's a topic and it's just you with a name and you want more people, try to explain why it's interesting. So that says nobody, I just try to pitch one topic, which I find interesting, this gateway API topic. Um, there was a discussion a few days ago basically to scope how placement should work. And what we came up with is placement and locations. And we concluded that it looks like a good axiom that locations give you, I mean, they are backed by clusters, but within a location, workloads can move around and they have consistent networking and storage all the time. Which means, for example, a location cannot be spread over cloud providers. So location is per cloud provider, because otherwise storage, for example, it's not seamless, right? You cannot um, detach from a, a PV and reattach without copying um, if you have cloud providers, which you have to cross. Networking is the same thing. So we want that workloads can move between workload clusters within one location and they get connectivity like to services. Um, for example. So one interesting question, and this is the topic here, is to find out what this means, how we can make that happen. Like you have clusters in the same availability zone of one cloud provider, and how can you make services happen to work? Sounds like a mesh SDN topic. I'm not an expert in networking, so other people here on the call are much better in that. But the question is, can we make that happen? Because this is crucial for the value proposition of TMC that you can move around. Like when one cluster goes down, maybe not by an accident, by maybe by eviction and uh, draining, and your workload moves over and this shouldn't be noticeable from outside. So you need something like um, a mesh over those clusters. So the question here is to investigate what this means. Gateway API is a big topic upstream, so I'm not sure this is the right term. Again, I'm not an expert. So everybody who likes networking and wants to drive the vision in this area, please join the topic. Any other topic we should discuss? How do we do on logos? That was exciting. We still want logos. Them. Yeah. It's a nice easy one. We can bike shed. <laughs> yeah, just just a hint. I created the PR with the logo. Is it here it is? Awesome. So I edit, this, I edit the sources. I mean, this is just uh, the, the logo I've chosen. I edit, you can see a readme here, which has the variants. So there are more depending on context we can use. That's a proposal I did. The sources are in there in the PR. So if anybody wants to take them and make it more awesome, please go ahead. Everything is open source, of course. Very cool. Hey, can you guys hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So the previous talk of it, think about, you know, getting transparent multi-cluster working for, I, I think it should be possible to get it working for at least services, right? Maybe not pod to pod communication, but at least uh, for pod to service communication, I think we should be able to get that working across clusters for a location. So we got a POC that we're starting for that. Um, I do worry about this notion of a location only encompassing a single cloud, right? 
um, just because like if your service in your app is not using PVs or anything like that, like maybe you do want to define a location being over multiple clouds because you want your servers to be able to move between clouds. You're not restricted to just one location. Ah, okay. The idea here is basically a location is what a cluster has been in the past. A cluster in the past in cube has nodes. And imagine all clusters in a location, every of those have nodes, right? And the union of the nodes is basically what this location represents. So it's like a meta cluster thing. And between nodes, you can also move, right? A, a workload can move, of course, there are restrictions, but in general, um, it's not sticky to a node. So nodes are more or less uniform in a cluster. Same idea. Okay. But you could define a location to be on multiple clouds. If you fulfill the axioms, yes. But as Andy said, movement between locations is also a possibility. It's the same, I mean, you can move to another location by changing the placement. That's all fine. Yeah, yeah no, I'm saying I want my app running on two clouds at the same time. Oh, this also works. Yeah. This also works. Multi-location okay. scheduled and placement, actually. Okay. That's part of the story. Okay. We are just saying in the moment you choose one location, it's one cloud and it's one availability zone and something like that. So but you can have multiple. So what is the difference then? The the exact difference. If a if an app can be on multiple locations, what is it that a location by you? Just a grouping? Because the scheduling seems to be the same. The placement is the same. The scheduling on the clusters and in, in the consequence on the nodes of the location, that's different. It's, in, it's independent. Uh, Stefan, I'm surprised at your answer. I was expecting to hear that the locations are visible to the user. So if yeah, I have also. an application in three locations, I know exactly what three locations there are, and I put it in exactly those three locations. Yeah. Whereas the, the division reason, within is, is yeah. separate. That's also the reason why a location should be uniform to a degree. Like the clusters behind shouldn't matter. Because if they did, the user has to understand what's going on, and it, as user shouldn't. Okay, let me ask a different way, I guess. So like, let's say I assign an app to two locations. That means it's gonna be running on both, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I have a, two clusters in one location and I assign it to a location, does it mean it only runs in one of the two clusters or does it run on both clusters? I think it depends on stuff we haven't implemented yet. So getting requirements, user stories, use cases will help us to deliver functionality like that if, if y'all need it. Um, we don't have it right now. We have some explorations around taking a single deployment that is created in a namespace in a workspace and replicating that to multiple sync targets or workload clusters, like actual clusters. Uh, but we haven't expanded that to do replicating across locations, to my knowledge. So this is still exploratory and uh, like getting concrete use cases written down will help us influence what the APIs and the functionality look like. Yeah, and I highlighted um, the line here, uh, John and David, they will look into the, the minimal placement object design, and this will touch all those topics we just started to discuss. So if you're interested, uh, if you can, can contribute works, uh, use cases, um, or even actual design work, API work, join the conversations there. So it's there. So we'll be meeting in the next week. Everybody's welcome. Okay. Stefan, do I understand the constraints of location correctly? That if you have a workload that is assigned to a location, that it can move freely within the compute that makes up that location with essentially no downtime because 
it's more or less homogenous. But if you move I mean, among location boundaries, then that's no longer true. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is one, this is, uh, I call it an axiom. It's a proposal for an axiom just to structure the problem domain we have here. Of course, we can have total diversity within a location, but this makes the problem harder. So the proposal is to have this restriction and have more than one location if you cannot fulfill the axiom. Andy? Um, yeah, just to follow up on your no downtime question, Chris, like there's, nothing right now or i should say we can't guarantee no downtime if you don't set up things correctly so uh i, I don't want folks to hear oh well clusters in a location guarantee no downtime that's not necessarily the case we can help you achieve zero downtime but it requires some a, a lot of upfront planning yeah yeah Just the in, Sorry. In, yeah. in, pot, uh, in nodes in cube, if you have nodes there, you want an SDN, right? So you want a transparent network. If you don't have that, you can still create nodes, but things won't work. And the same thing here. You have to fulfill those requirements via some, I know, service mesh thing. I don't like the word because it sounds big. I hope this is much smaller. But you have to install certain things to make those clusters compatible and work together. So it's like SDN for nodes, similar. Chris? Oh, uh, yes, I was just going to say, right, kind of follow up on what Andy was saying, right? Or I think Andy is saying, don't talk about it in terms of no downtime. I think the, the critical, it seems to me, likely the critical concept is, is it user visible or not? Right? Do users manage what goes in? from what goes in what location the we leave it to the tmc to manage under the covers how stuff is moved around within a location placed and moved around within a location and there may be some small speed bumps uh we don't want them to be very large um and that's kind of the the idea is that right yes yeah what yeah. i was trying to suss out is based on the constraints what the difference is between movement within a location and then among location on um, like different locations like operationally or user visibility wise what does that constrain buy you i think it's not about buying you it's just about a feasibility right we, we can't um i get i mean it's, maybe it's a matter of just how big is the speed bump right but the storage example is is illustrative right we could imagine automated copying of storage from one cloud to another. Uh, it would still remain the case, you know, if it's read-write storage, that it's writable in only one cloud. Uh, so it's in only one location at a time. So there is, you know, for storage, this kind of semantic fact of life that practically speaking, it's going to be in one location at a time. And by the way, this problem of workloads getting stuck to, like, let's say, um, a cloud, like TVs, it's more fine-grained than that. Workloads could get stuck to clusters. Because two clusters in a single data center could be different enough that, uh, you know, workloads get stuck to it, right? Like, for example, one could be uh, for data compliance reasons. you got a European server and a U.S. server. Uh, it could be also be a cluster that has GPU resources, the other one doesn't. So it's it, it's also more fine grained than just the whole data center kind of location thing. So the user doesn't know clusters in a location. So if something is stuck, the user will not understand that it's stuck either, right? Just if the cluster goes down. Yeah, I also so, Hiram, I'm not sure I follow the example, right? I mean, I. Uh, first off, clouds don't even expose data centers, right? They expose uh, availability zones and regions, typically. And yeah. if it, right, and each one of those is in one particular country, so you know there is, say, GDPR or not. It's 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 not like there's a division within one region, right? Yeah, but I mean, I'm just saying, like, like I don't know if you want to model, like, say, like, uh, your age. Or 
I'm sorry, you're breaking up very badly. I can't tell what you're saying. Um, I'm sorry. sorry. Well, basically, like for data compilers, you might need to keep your data on availability zones that are in Europe, right? Well, okay, but that that would so you don't want to make sure European and European right. Stuff. So it's it's more specific than cloud. It might be go down to cloud region. Oh I'll yes, buy that. Yes, and it, and it could go down to cluster. You could have a cluster that's made up of of worker nodes that have GPU resources, right? And so there's certain workloads you only want to target that cluster because not all clusters so, are going to have those GPU resources. Looking at the clock again, great discussions. Can we move that either into the doc? So John has a doc. Maybe you can see on the call. I don't think it's probably late for him. Um, we can link the doc here. There's a doc um, filled or starting to fill up with use cases as requirements. People can put their input there. And the other thing is the meeting. So the meeting about the design. So I would propose to move that to the design meeting. This is the purpose exactly of this meeting. So it's great to hear, to hear the discussion. Let's move it to the meeting, and then we can spend the hour or more time as much as we want to continue that. Super discussion, but uh, I think we have to look on, on, the, on the clock at the moment. So Mike and uh, who was it? Hiram, if you want to add yourself to the list there of the people, of the names, just go ahead. Of great input, so please get involved. I would like to, but I really uh, could easily promise too much here. I, I need to be uh, careful, I'm not then set up for too much. Comment asy asynchronously on the docs. There will be docs. There's, there will be a recording. That's also super fun. Paul, do you want to say anything about timing? When do we expect those meetings? In terms of timing, we're hoping to have those to be discussable in the next community call. And ideally that people can start developing on these probably on Monday. So if we can get design worked out in the next couple of days, if you can't, that's fine. It doesn't mean we need to rush it. We need to get it right first. But uh, that's that's kind of the target that we would have is the rest of the month after this week for development. And just one note, please record the meetings if possible and publish afterwards so people who are not in the time zone can at least listen to the video later. All right. So I'm looking forward to great design discussions, invitations for them. So um, if there's no other topic, I would move on to the usual task of issues, new issues. Paul, is this OK? Yep, no All right, so incoming issues, so you have a team. Um, all right, so there are not so many actually, so we do good work in grooming. Let's start with the first one. Delegate to virtual workspace readiness checks. That's David right here. I think you are. Yeah, and just as a reminder, um, yeah trying to keep the discussion on these to a minimum it's more about just deciding the milestone yeah it, it, sorry uh, shrine there um in fact i fixed that uh, this morning it was a follow-up issue uh, that was that popped up in the last weeks uh and the peer is approved and now you know checks are okay so it should be merged today i assume all right so I move it to zero six even though it's not a blocker, maybe. If you can, if you can link the PR, that's fine. Sure. Um, Sean, add acceptance of permission API to API binding. He uh, was just creating subtasks from the epic oh, that you see linked there okay. for 1219. Nine tasks, so we can skip all of them, or is there anything we should talk about? That's an epic for the release, right? This is for permissions and the claims. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he's not on the call right now that I see. Okay, so it's a milestone, I would guess. Yeah, I think we we want this in um, in some variant, like one scope. 
scope. We have a scope. Yeah, I think stuff, yeah. Uh, your suggestion to have the the cut line for what's must have versus can come later, uh, we should do. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, I'll work with him on that. That's great. All right, so let's see what else. All those belong to the same topic, right? Here's the next one. Difficult to understand error message. Mike, you can maybe elaborate. Sure, it's really simple. Um, I tried to create a, a child workspace named root, um, and uh, it got an error message that uh, you know was, comes from somewhere. It's nested, right? It's, it's wrapped. It reflects several layers of. It's coming from somewhere in the code that I don't know. You know, a user is not going to understand, right? I think the, the conceptually, right, it's pretty simple. Uh, you know, the, the name root is reserved for the actual root. You can't put the name root on any other workspace. So the error message should just say that. Yeah, there's a, there's a logical on uh, not in the in the expression in Open API, and this gives you that output, which is not helpful. So I can give pointers if anybody wants to look into admission. This can be done. It's a good first issue if you want to learn about admission. So we need another check with a human understandable error, right? That's what you want, uh, what you mean. Technically, right. it's validated, but it's just not helpful. So if anybody has interest, just ping me. We can put pointers there. Right, next one. Yeah, this is one I totally agree with. I think we are at a position where we need another update of the readme. Andy, you did the last one three months ago, four months ago. Yeah, I'm happy to try and come back to it, but it's not going to take priority over code at this point. Yeah, but there is work to be done. I totally agree. Yeah. I think we are much further than what we wrote there and should update. So. I put it here, no promise when we get to that. I'm not sure which bucket it is. Maybe it's repo heads, it's not codes or something like that. So no disagreement, Mike. This needs work for sure. All right, this was my wish to have. We have pro in the work, so Steve is doing great work to move us to pro and get rid of the restrictions of the work, uh, the workflows of GitHub. I think we are near, so maybe Steve can explain in a second. Um, this one is about the document, something which points to, this is the OpenShift release repo where we put stuff now. Yeah. Something like that, the link. Yeah, um, I mean, the update's pretty minor. Basically, we just have jobs now running via prow on a cube cluster um, that mirror what we were doing in the GitHub Actions, SANS 1. Um, I would hope that we, I don't know, I, I guess it's kind of a double-edged sword. I would hope that we are able to give enough juice and like computational power to these jobs such that they run faster and we see fewer of these like pathological flakes. Um, it's definitely, hiding some bugs we really have in the product, but at the same time, like I'm not sure that having CI flake out 85% of the time is a useful uh, signal to anybody. So that's the hope anyway. And our tests are getting bigger. So I think more use is something we need very soon. So I think that's great. Yeah, is it an interesting question at some point? We might want to have a conversation about, like, do we ever run anything other than the shared server test? Um, like what signal do we get from other ones? Yeah. Is it worth it? Obviously the overhead of having to like start an entire KCP and etcd for each test case is pretty high. Yeah. I mean, let's move that to the Slack, I think. Yeah. We yeah. have to solve this question and all right. So anyway, good work, great work. I like it. Um, Next one, still have four minutes or so. Uh, that's a flake, right? Oh yeah, that one. So there's a creation issue. I think Andy, you had ideas. Uh, I'm not 
I'm not sure. It's I think I saw I saw this locally and just ignored it because it wasn't bothering me. But uh, I I don't know anything about this. It's even another one, I think. Okay, I no idea. It's a flake. So somebody wants challengers to debug. So here's one. In general, if you have flags, if you see flags in your PRs, please open issues for them. We track them. All right, this one, I heard there was work. Is, has this merged, Joachim? There, there's two about... halves to it. Half of it's in. Okay. Uh, the environment variable fix is in. This is about volume mounts. Um, so that's harder to do. I see. OK. So it's one of those things which we have to where we have to improve the rewriting, right? To make the experience more seamless that workloads think they are in the real cluster, although they are running outside of KCP. All right. And where did I stop? I lost track. Did I close the window? I don't know. Sean, Sean, Sean. Missing end to end test for syncing in connection to. Oh, yeah, this is. We have finalizers and we, we touched the topic earlier today about the uh, life cycle of um, workloads when a cluster goes down. And there is code about finalizers in place. Uh, I think it's partly under a feature gate. Joachim will know more yes. details. Yes, the finalizers are still feature gate. It's part of the advanced scheduling PR. I'm working right now on, on moving uh, the finalizers, the Kubernetes ones and the virtual ones outside of the feature gate by okay. adding the proper end-to-end -end test. So should be I go tomorrow. So it's, in, so. it's in progress. That's cool. Yeah. And maybe a last one for today. Um, that one sync KCP cube config to workloads. Is this I think you discussed it, Andy, and yeah, so this is really for anything that is pod specable. Like right now we mutate oh. deployments, but we don't do anything else. So if you have a job, a cron job, stateful set, replica set, anything else that's got a pod spec in it. Uh, it's not going to get the same stuff. I see. So we have one example as a deployment, but we need many more mutators to do the same for other types. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we could have like uh, a collection of GR, like group resources and paths to a pod spec in them. And then you could just generically have this thing apply to a bunch. Makes sense. So if anybody wants to help in uh, transparent multi cluster, this is, I think, also a good one. All right. So it's at the top of the hour. I think we made some progress here in the list. Thank you, everybody, for the great discussions. And please don't forget to invite people as next week. So design discussions should start, should start and move us forward a bit in understanding. That's all great. So thank you, everybody, and see you next week. Thank you. Thanks.